In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Shalom, dear friend. This is wonderful to be again with you today. And uh, we have a great friend today, Nehemiah Gordon. This is wonderful to have him. We spoke already about his book uh, last week, which is the name is Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence, the Hebrew Power of the Priestly Blessing Unleashed. This is a very powerful book. And we're going, we carry on speaking about it because there is so many treasure inside. So Nehemiah, tell us a bit. We were speaking last time more about the Jewish community, mm -hmm. how they will be affected by the book. Yeah. Because I think there is powerful books who can really touch a lot of the community. And I really think that your book will be like that. So it will touch the Jewish community. And how do you think it will touch now the Christian community too? Well, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, in the last book I wrote before this that I co-wrote with Keith Johnson, uh, Prayer to Our Father and the Hebrew Origins of the Lord's Prayer, we had a really interesting experience where we, uh, we, went to the, we were traveling around Israel and we went to the Sea of Galilee and we met this little old rabbi. And Keith asked him a question, this is like an ultra-Orthodox rabbi, uh, and he asked him the question, he said, Rabbi, when I as a Christian, Keith was saying, when I as a Christian pray to God his Father, is that the same God that you pray to his Father? And the rabbi said, yes, of course, it's the same. we have the same Father, it's the same, our Heavenly Father, it's the, it's the same God. And we actually mentioned that in the book. Well, when the book came out, Keith uh, sent a copy to a friend of his who is a, an, an evangelical Christian scholar, apparently a very famous one, I'm not going to mention his name, but... Uh, I'm told he's, he's written books and everything, and, and he asked him for feedback on a prayer to our father. Uh, um, and the uh, scholar was reading through the book, and all of a sudden he got to the story about the little old rabbi, and he stopped and wrote in the margin, no, the Christian God is triangle. And he actually wrote a triangle in, in the margin of his book and sent the book back, registered mail to Keith to show his dissatisfaction. And, um, and, and I thought that was really ironic because, uh, not ironic as in the blessing, but ironic. Um, I thought that was very ironic because Jews actually, in Jewish mysticism, they'll use the symbol of the triangle as representing the three aspects of God's character. Now, you as a Christian are probably wondering, well, wait a minute, uh, <laughs> three aspects of God, that, you know, Jews don't believe that, but we do. And actually the name Yehovah, the name of our Heavenly Father, the name that, that God commanded the priest to place over the people in the blessing, that name is actually a compound name. It's made up of three Hebrew verbs. The three Hebrew verbs, haya, hove, yehiyeh, which means he who was, he who is, and he who will be. And actually, this is something that's recited uh, during many Jewish prayers, the statement, haya, hove, yehiyeh, he was, he is, who will be. This is like a key uh, concept in Judaism, and it's so important in Judaism, that, and, and all three of those together, they make up the name Yehovah. It's so important in Judaism that this triangle that represents the name of our Heavenly Father and the three aspects mm -hmm. of our Heavenly Father's name, Yehovah, is actually on the flag of Israel. That's one of the explanations that uh, it, where they get the flag with the, with the Star of David, which is made up of tr two triangles. Mm -hmm. One triangle, they say, represents the name Yehovah, or Hayahoveh, he was, he was, he was, he is, he will be, which, by the way, appears in, also in the, not only in Judaism, that appears in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. It refers to him as he who was, he who is, and he who will be. And then uh, the other triangle actually represents the Messiah. Uh, and how does it represent the Messiah? In Paleo-Hebrew, uh, and maybe you talk about this in your book, I don't remember, in, in, uh, uh, on the alphabet, in Paleo-Hebrew, the Hebrew letter for Dalet, for Duh, was a, was a triangle. And the name David is, starts off with a triangle, and it ends with a triangle. And so that second triangle in the Star of David and the flag of Israel actually represents David himself, uh, and hence why David, because David, we believe, is the ancestor of the Messiah, and I think Jews and Christians are in agreement on that, yeah. that the Messiah has to be a descendant of King David. And so the flag of Israel essentially represents the name of our Heavenly Father and, and his Messiah and with the true triangle. So I thought it was ironic that a Christian would read this and say, oh, you know, Yehovah, and the, you know, you Jews referring to God as Father, that's not the same Father as we have, because we've got the triangle. Guess what? We got the triangle also. And, and, they, and I believe they are the same God. Now, obviously, we have different understandings, but you know what? I'm going to leave that to the theologians to hash it out. Um, I don't understand theology. I know about text and scripture, and I can see in the text and scripture that we're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
and it's the same God. And, and, I, and I actually, we were talking before the program about this uh, Arab man from East Jerusalem mm -hmm. who I had met a number of years ago that really had a profound impact on me. And he told me this story, and uh, now you have to understand, I mean, you know this because you live here, mm -hmm. Arabs who are born in this country, many of them hate us and want to kill us and as Jews. And um, this Arab hated Jews. And he, was stand and he was a Christian. And he was standing from a long line of Christian, uh, his family's long line of Christians. And he was standing on the Mount of Olives, he tells. And all of a sudden, he's praying and he hears a voice say, why do you say you love me when you hate my people? And then he heard the verse that God said to Abraham, those who bless you will be blessed and those who curse you will be cursed. And he realized if he was going to be a true Christian and really love the God of Scripture, he would have to love the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he has now gone around the world preaching to people, which is amazing. An Arab is telling people you have to love Israel and you have to love the Jews. And um, you know, I think that, that, that really like had a profound impact when I heard that. Um, you know, because from my perspective, of course, that's true. You know, uh, but to hear a Christian say that yes, we have the same God, and that God blessed Israel, and that blessing is still in force. And of course, obviously, Christians, you know, have a set of beliefs of their own that I'm, you know, respecting. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, recognizing that Israel is God's people, and and God has blessed those people, and the statement, "Those who bless you will bless, and those who curse you will be cursed," still stands. And um, you know that. I think this priestly blessing, that's why it's relevant for all mankind. Mm -hmm. He isn't just the God of, of, uh, of Israel. He's the God of humanity, mm -hmm. of every human being. And when he taught the priests to make the blessing over the people, I think that's a blessing that anybody can speak and proclaim over the people. And it was Kenyans, who I'm pretty sure weren't Jewish. Up on that uh, Mount Sinai, the traditional Mount Sinai, that if you remember the last episode, I talked about how they spoke the name of the Father over me, and I had this experience uh, that changed my life. And so I really think this is something that's relevant for all mankind. This is both in the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, or the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and it's also in the New Testament. And Jesus was the one who taught people in the prayer. And this is what we wrote about in the prayer to our Father. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that his prayer opens, our Father in heaven. And then it says, hallowed be thy name, which really means may your name be sanctified. It's a commandment, a call to action to sanctify our Heavenly Father's name. Mm -hmm. Well, you need to know what that name is. That name you know, has got to be important to you if... if Jesus is teaching people to sanctify that name. And obviously in Judaism it's important. The name appears 6,827 times. You know, one of the really beautiful things you'll see if you go to certain Jewish synagogues, not all, but some of them, will have a plaque on the wall, and it's called a Shiviti plaque. And Shiviti means, uh, it's actually a verse from Psalms which says, Shiviti Yehovah le negdi tamid, I place Yehovah before me always. And they'll have the word yud he vav hey, the four-letter name of the, uh, in Hebrew of, of, of our Heavenly Father, Yehovah. They'll have that in Hebrew, and they'll have above it and below it the little words from the verse, I place you know, Yehovah before me always, and this will be at the front of the synagogue. And that's so we don't get confused, because oh, yes. you know, we'll have the Torah at the front of the synagogue, and the Torah is a holy book. It's the word of the living God. But we're not supposed to worship the Torah. We're supposed to worship the one who spoke the Torah. And that's why they'll have this, they'll have this you know, at, ver at holy sites, so we you know, don't go to the western wall and worship the stones of the wall. They're holy. Mm -hmm. you know, this is part of the, the outer enclosure of the temple that Herod built, so that's a holy spot. But the stones were not to worship. We're to worship the creator of the universe and his name, mm -hmm. the name that he, he uh, revealed to Moses in uh, Exodus 3.15, the name that he said, this is my name forever. This is literally, it says, my mention for, for, a generation, for every generation. Mm -hmm. This is something that has to be relevant to us. And so I think it's so beautiful, that Shiviti plaque, the I place Yehovah before me always. And, and, and that, that really what this is really what this book is about, that he said it, and they shall place my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. And not all the book is about the name. I'd pr say probably, I don't know, maybe a third or something like that, or half of the book is about the name. Uh, then I go into some of the more uh, amazing details about the actual blessing. But mm -hmm. I actually, in a way, I feel like this book is, um, and it's funny because I sat down and wrote an outline early on in the process, and it's nothing like the outline whatsoever of the book. The book kind of wrote itself. I would sit down, and, and I actually wrote a lot of the book in, in uh, Jerusalem cafes because mm -hmm. um, the air conditioning is so hot here. Um, and I would be sitting there typing, and sometimes I would be weeping in tears because the things I was writing about were so emotionally, like I had to. There's no way I could have expressed this without digging deep inside me and trying to pour those things out. And that's what I did in the book. And, you know, the waitress would, like, come up and, like, are you okay? Can we bring you a, a, a handkerchief? And I'm, like, you know, I'm okay. And, you know, wiping my tears and continuing to type. And, mm -hmm. and so, really, I poured a lot of myself into the book. But, you know, there's such powerful stories. And one of the things we were talking about before was the, the, the story of the Yom Kippur War. 
This is amazing. Is, yeah. an amazing just, story. Just tell us about it. And also tell us how to get your book. Oh, how they can, can get it from the book? website, uh, nehemiaswall.com. Nehemia is very easy to spell. Uh, they'll have it on the screen here. Uh, nehemiaswall.com or nehemiaswall.com. That's my website, and, and currently that's the only place you can get the book. Uh, it's available now for pre-order, and maybe by the time this is broadcast, it'll already be, you know, be shipping. Um, and uh, you know, the, the story of the Yom Kippur War was, and, and how that ties into to the, 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 the blessing is, is, to me, one of the most powerful things. So um, I was doing this research on the book, and, and, um, and you know, the Yom Kippur War, you have to understand, for the Jews, is, it happened, it 19, started 1973, October 6, 1973, mm -hmm. there was a surprise attack on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the Jewish year. And, um, Which is the day where the name of God has to be said in the actually, temple. Actually, that's right. So, so yeah. actually, on Yom Kippur, the high priest would stand in the temple and proclaim the name Yehovah ten times. Mm -hmm. And every time he would proclaim it, this is in the ancient Jewish sources, um, the entire congregation, meaning the, every, all, the entire nation, the thousands of people gathered in the temple, they would hear the name, and it says they would bow down with their faces to the ground, and they would proclaim, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Leolam Va'ed, which means blessed is the glorious name of his kingdom forever. And this, this is a kingdom name, this name, Yehovah. It, it's a royal name. And uh, they would proclaim that ten times. And this proves that it couldn't have been a secret. In the first century, when the thousands of Jews would be gathered in the temple on the Day of Atonement, they heard him proclaim it ten times. They also heard it three times during the priestly blessing. That was one of the really interesting things I found in my research, that the rabbis tell us that when, um, that, that when the, they would proclaim the priestly blessing, you know, the three-line blessing, may uh, Yehovah bless you and keep you, may Yehovah uh, shine his face upon you and be gracious to you, may Yehovah lift his face towards you and, and give you peace. They, three times it has the name Yehovah, and each time they, would, were, they were required to proclaim the name three times when the priest did it in the, in the temple. And the rabbis who, who later forbade, forbade the name in the second century CE or AD, they're the ones who tell us that in the temple it was had to be proclaimed because of the verse. Mm -hmm. Number 627, they shall place my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. So it was a commandment to uh, proclaim the name in the temple. And when the temple was destroyed, certain things happened with the, the Romans actually started out banning the name. And then and there was actually a rabbi named Hanina ben Teradion. And uh, actually when Keith was in Israel a while back, we actually went to his grave in the Galilee. This was a rabbi who was arrested by the Romans for speaking the name Yehovah in public and he was burned at the stake. They wrapped him in a Torah scroll, put tufts of wool between the Torah scroll and him that were wet to take longer for him to die, and they lit him on fire. And, that, and it says in the Talmud, it says that he, this happened because he spoke the name the way it is written, which means in the second century Jews, a hundred years after Jesus, Jews were speaking the name and being martyred for speaking the name, and martyred by the Romans. And, the, and you know, what that shows you is that it wasn't a secret until after that. It wasn't forbidden by the rabbis until after that. Um, and even after that, they continued to transmit it. It says, sage disciple once every seven years. And that's what the title means, shattering the conspiracy of silence. It's actually a legitimate conspiracy. The rabbi said, we know this name, but we're going to, shh, don't talk about it. We're not allowed to say what the name is, except for our disciples once every seven years. But you guys, you can't hear about the name. But God wants us to know that name. He said, this is my name forever, my name for all generations. So let me tell you about the Yom Kippur War. Yeah. Okay, so October 6, 1973. Israel is surrounded by numerous Arab nations, and there's a surprise attack on the Day of Atonement. Uh, now, how does this tie into the priestly blessing? Well, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon is when the war began, and around that time, priests all over Israel proclaimed the priestly blessing. That's part of the ritual of, the Yom, of, of Yom Kippur. They traditionally stretch their hands out, and, and this is a, the tradition of how the, the priests do it. They stretch their hands out, and they make the blessing over the people. And, and I believe that blessing was honored, even though they didn't use the name. It was still honored. Now, one of the really cool things I found out is that this thing that, you know, like Mr. Spock used to say, live long and prosper, right? Where does that come from? Well, the guy who used to play Spock in Star Trek, he was a Jewish actor named Leon Nimoy. And uh, he says that he saw the, the you know, they, for, the, for the television show, they needed something exotic. And he remembered from the synagogue that the priests used to stretch out their hands like this. Well, I did some research and found out where this comes from doing like this over the people, and it actually comes from when the rabbis ban the name, the priests who have, a, who have an obligation to, to place the name on the people, they were in a very difficult dilemma. They said, wait a minute, we're, if I speak the name, I'll be excommunicated from the community, but God told me I've got to speak the name over the people when I make the blessing in the synagogue. And so what they would do is they'd go like this, and this was a hand signal 
to represent the name yud heh vav the name Yehovah. And if you look at how the letters are written, and I show this in the book, in, in ancient Hebrew, in uh, the Hebrew of that period, they wrote it as yud heh vav heh. So this, now you might look at this and say, well, it doesn't really look like that. But, you know, this symbol, okay. Actually, people's lives depend on this symbol. Divers can live or die based on this symbol, that things are okay. Now, you might say it doesn't really look like a K, but if you know what the symbol means, you know that this is okay. And this was the point of the, of the hand signal, the hand gesture of the priests. This represents Yehovah, and this is how they place the name over the people. Well, as they're placing this name over the people in Yom Kippur 1973, the Syrians and Egyptians launch a surprise attack against Israel. And Israel was taken off guard. And we actually, what happened in the Golan Heights, which is the northern part, um, there were 1,400 Syrian tanks that invaded Israel over a span of 50, 50 miles. Now, just to give you some, some, um, you know, some perspective of what that means, you know, a lot of people don't know if 1,400 is that a lot or not. Well, um, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union with 2,000 tanks over a 900-mile front. And this is 1,400 over a 50-mile front. So that's a lot of tanks in a very small area. And Israel only had 177 tanks on the, uh, up in the Golan at the time, and they were completely taken off guard. It was a three-pronged attack. The middle and the, and the, and the southern uh, prongs of the attack were successful almost immediately, and the Israeli lines collapsed, and they very quickly reached the western edge of the Golan Heights. And if you look in a map, you can see that if you reach the western he edge of the Golan Heights, there's nothing between you and the heart of Israel. And there's actually a, a do documented example where um, a Syrian commander radioed to his uh, officers back in, in, uh, in Syria and said, I see the Galilee stretched out before me, permission to advance. And they said, permission denied. If they had advanced, there would have been nothing to stop them. They would have rolled through Israel, cut it in half, and it would have ceased to be a nation. And they actually, it, it, like you have to understand, this wasn't just another war. For Israel, this is what they called this an existential war. And what they meant by that is we continue to exist or not based on this war. They talked about a second Holocaust if we lose. That's how serious this was. And the Syrians defeated us almost immediately, except in one little place in the north, where the northern prong of the, of the invasion force of the Syrians got caught up. And it was a place that became known later as the Valley of Tears. And it was called that because Israel destroyed so many Syrian tanks. The Israelis fought there for four grueling days. And then at the end of the four grueling uh, uh, period, a period of almost about 80 hours, the end of this period, uh, Israel, the Israeli force was down to only seven tanks. And, uh, and actually we have a member of Knesset, uh, Avigdor Kahalani, who was the commander of those seven tanks. Uh, he's become like a famous person in Israel ever since. Well, so he's down to seven tanks, and he radios and, and basically says, look, we can't hold on anymore. You know, uh, one of the groups there of, the, of three or four tanks said, okay, permission to withdraw, we've got no more shells. And, uh, and they said, permission denied, you've got to hold out a little bit longer. And they started uh, passing out hand grenades so that when the Syrians came to, to take them, they would, they would be able to blow a few Syrians up and, and die at least trying to, to fight. And uh, at that moment when they were uh, firing the last of the shells of the seven tanks, uh, 13 tanks showed up. And they, were, and they had been damaged in previous battles. They were manned by uh, the commander of all the, seven, of the 13 new tanks that showed up. Um, had actually been in Nepal on his honeymoon, and he heard about the war, and he flew back through Tehran <laughs> in Iran, and then through Athens back to Israel, drove north, and put together 13 damaged tanks that they had been uh, repaired and were barely battle-worthy, and some of the people manning those tanks had escaped from the hospital from in, in Sfat, in Safed, to come to the front, because they realized if we lose this, if we lose this, it's over. We don't, you know... They don't see, the Syrians didn't take prisoners back then. If we lose this, the country ceases to exist. So they went to the front, even though they, had, they literally escaped from the hospital, and the 13 tanks show up at the last minute when the other seven tanks are about to be overrun, and they start firing. And then the Syrians did something amazing. They started to retreat, which I still, I, I mean, you can see I'm emotional because this isn't supposed to happen. And to me, I see this and I see, hey, this is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. There's 20 tanks in the field. Seven of them don't have ammunition. And, what are the, and the Syrians have hundreds of tanks, the most advanced Soviet tanks back in 1973, in the field that, that are, are still operational, and, they've, and they start to retreat. When we had no chance, if they would have just fought on for another 10 minutes, we, would, we wouldn't be sitting here. This would, be, this would be part of Syria today if, if that had happened. And they start to retreat. And what do the Israelis do, those 20 tanks, seven of them without ammunition? They chase the Syrians back to the border, into Syria. 
And that's a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. It talks about how one will chase uh, you know, a thousand and two will chase ten thousand and, and these things, or five will chase ten thousand. It's literally this blessing. God, bl- this is part of the blessing in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And God blessed us in this way. And I put all the pieces together. The priests, even though they didn't speak the name because of tradition, the day. They, the day. The day that they spoke it. They placed the name on the people and God honored that blessing. And to me, that's a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. It's also an expression of one of the phrases in the prayer, now to get a little bit technical. So there's this very mysterious phrase, which says, literally in Hebrew, may Jehovah lift his countenance or lift his face towards you. Well, what does that mean? Well, so in Hebrew, we have this concept called hester panim. It appears all over the Hebrew Bible, and that means hidden face. Hidden face means God interacts. He performs a miracle from behind the scenes. Okay. And, Esther, uh, Esther, the clear example, actually the name Esther means hidden. It has to do with Hester Panim, the hidden face. Because mm-hmm. if you look throughout the book of Esther, you don't see the name of God mentioned not even once. In fact, even the word God doesn't appear in the book of Esther. And when I tell people this, when I heard this myself, I was shocked. I'm like, how is that possible? This is a miracle that God performed. And that's the whole point. God performs the miracle, and he's hidden in plain sight. And he's so hidden in plain sight, he's not even mentioned. Not by a name, not by a title. But it's obvious that this is the hand of God. And I believe that's what happened in Yom Kippur, that it's obvious to me this was the hand of God when you look at everything that happened. And, um, you know, so, so this face, this concept may has lift his face towards you. That's the opposite of hester panim, of hidden face. Mm-hmm. That's the revealed face, where God reveals his face and performs overt miracles. Now, what happened in October 1973 in the Yom Kippur War, some people will tell you, That's Hester Panim, it's the hidden face. Other people look at it and say, no, that's the revealed face. Mm -hmm. And what are they referring to? Well, there's there's this account that the Israelis were interrogating a Syrian commander, Mm -hmm. and he had actually stopped when he reached this line of hills that was being manned by the seven tanks and the 13 tanks. Um, It's called the line of of Tells, which are these little volcanic... The uh, line of? The line of Tells. Uh, In this context, a Tell is a a volcanic Mm -hmm. um, cone. The, the eastern part of the Golan is covered with these volcanic cones. Mm-hmm. He says, you reached the line of hills and you stopped. Why did you stop? During the interrogation, the Syrian said, I saw a line of white angels and a hand coming down from heaven motioning to me, stop. And so I stopped. <laughs> now, that's God revealing his face. Mm-hmm. That's not the hidden face. That's Jehovah lifting his face towards us and performing a miracle. Against your foes. Wow. Wow. And, and, and what's so amazing there is that, um, you, know, is, you know, look, this reminds me of a story in the Bible mm-hmm. where some people looked at it and they said that's the hidden face and other people said it's the revealed face. And that's the story of Elisha or Elisha in English. Mm-hmm. And there's a story about he was surrounded by the Syrians, the same Syrians from Damascus. Mm-hmm. He was surrounded by the Syrians and his, his servant looks out and he says, we've got no chance here. We're dead. They've come to kill us. And Elisha prayed and said, please, Jehovah, open his eyes that he may is see. The name, is it the name Jehovah there? Uh, I believe it is. But anyway, he asked there and he says, uh, open, open this man's eyes so he can see. And all of a sudden, his eyes are opened and he sees what he didn't see, which was there was another army, a second army, an army, the same one the Syrian general saw in 1973, an army with chariots of fire. And, it, and that army defeated the Syrians of that day. And in 1973, the, the hidden army, the Syrians could see it, the Israelis couldn't see it, their eyes were closed to it. It defeated the, Ar- the Syrians of 1973. And this is one of the things I pray to my Heavenly Father. I say, Yehovah, and this is actually something I, we pray during, you know, I do this program with uh, Joan Ovandor and Keith mm-hmm. Johnson, mm-hmm. Torah Pearls, where we do a weekly discussion on the Torah, which is it's amazing. There's really nothing like it. We've got a Karaite Jew, we've got a Christian pastor, and I don't even know what Jono is, and, uh, and the three of us get together uh, in three continents. I'm in Israel, he's in Australia, and the other one's in, in right. North Carolina and America. And we're talking about the Torah portion, just what does it say in the text? And one of the things that we've made of tradition during this is to pray a prayer from Psalm 119. And the prayer, this is a prayer that David prayed. And the prayer he prayed in Psalm 119 is, Yehovah, open my eyes that I may see the wonderful hidden things of your Torah. That's what it literally says in Hebrew. And this is what I pray to the creator of the universe. Yehovah, open my eyes that I may see the things that are hidden to me. And I'm humble enough to say, I think I know a lot, but there's a lot I don't know. And whatever it is you reveal to me, I will embrace that and accept that. So I, I, this is a, a, a genuine prayer that Yehovah, open my eyes that I may see the wonderful hidden things of your word, of your scripture, of your Torah. This is amazing. This reminds me of the passage in Isaiah 66 
Humble. Why say the man that I love is the one who is humble? And do you know the passage? Uh, the kind of person on whom I will look with favor is one with a poor and humble spirit who trembles at my word. Mm. I love this, Isaac. Yeah. It's just amazing. That's a powerful verse. Yeah. Wow. Because it's, he, revealed, yeah, he revealed himself mm -hmm. at, that, at that time. Yep. This is just amazing. What else? And then I'll actually be touring around speaking about this book all over the U.S. Um, and actually in other places as well. Keith Johnson and I will be traveling to China. We'll be traveling to China to speak uh, all over China in, in at least uh, five places. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is a very big deal because there's you know, millions of people in China who are looking for the truth and don't have access to this type of information to you know, the, the Hebrew roots of their faith. And so this is really unprecedented. And it was, when it was presented to the people in China um, by somebody over in Hong Kong, they said, yes, we want to hear this. This is important for our people to hear. And so th this is uh, you know, kind of, a, I think it's very important. China is the most populous country in the world, and they don't have access to this information. So I'm excited about that, that we're going to China. We'll be all over the U.S. traveling and speaking about this. And um, I'm the just excited to share this with people. Mm. Wonderful. So is the word coming out of Zion? I, I, well, you know, in it a way is. it is, yeah. yeah. In a way, we're, uh, I'm able in my small way to fulfill that, the oh. verse in Isaiah chapter 2. Yeah. It's amazing. So listen, friends, this is, we are living amazing days. And there is some things like, you know, tough time, like, like the Yom Kippur war, but you can see, they could see the hand of God. Mm -hmm. This is just amazing. So... I hope that you enjoy this program. I did enjoy this program. <laughs> thank you, Nehemiah. We always learn. And thank you for coming again here and, and sharing with the people. And don't forget, uh, friends, we're living in the last days. You've been watching In the Last Days.